Hello everybody, welcome to the Sports and Money today. I'm Ben Parker. Thank you for being a part of our video today. Thank you for joining us wherever you're watching from. I hope you're doing well. We're looking at the Kansas City Chiefs defense today and we have a lot to look at. So this is going to be a long video. For those of you who aren't Chiefs fans or Kansas City fans, I apologize. This is going to be a long video because there is a lot to get to and a lot to look at. We're going to look at three things today. I'm going to start by looking at the guys who left this offseason. Just a quick overview of the guys who departed. A quick look at the guys who are either filling their spots or who are new to the team. Then the, this will take the most time. We're going to go through position by position and look at every guy on the starting lineup for the Kansas City Chiefs. And then we'll end up with just a quick mention of the draft. I'm not going to target any specific players. I'm just going to talk about the feel for what the Chiefs might do here on defense in the draft coming up in just about a week. So let's get started. The guys who left this offseason... Benny Logan, the defensive tackle, the nose tackle, he is gone. He signed a free agent deal with the Tennessee Titans, and the Chiefs really decided not to pursue that too much. Derek Johnson, probably the guy that you're going to miss the most, I would say, at least off the field. Derek Johnson, longtime linebacker for the Kansas City Chiefs, super talented guy. It took him a season or two to catch on, but once he did, wow, he just really tore it up from a defensive standpoint. His production had tailed off the past couple of seasons, and the Chiefs decided to let him go. They, they might be able to replace his own field production. I think they can in the next season or two, but they're, they're going to have a very difficult time replacing him in the locker room. And then, of course, just what he meant to Chiefs fans in general. So goodbye to Derek Johnson. We'll see him perhaps on another NFL team now. Also, you've got Ron Parker leaving out from the secondary. They saved about $5 million in letting him go, as they did letting Derek Johnson go. Also, you saw Tomba Holly leave. Uh, Holly did not play hardly at all last year. If he played any, I'm not sure he played any last year. But you're not going to miss him so much on the field, but you will miss him off the field as well because he was a really loved guy by the Chiefs fans also. It's a bit difficult to replace him from an, an off-the-field locker room kind of presence. Anytime you see these long-time guys go, you know the makeup of the defense is going to just change. The makeup of the team, the character, the nature of the team is going to change. Hopefully for the Chiefs, it's going to change for the better. But we'll see in upcoming in, in the upcoming uh, season as well. Also, you have Marcus Peters. Now, this one is the most controversial traded to the Rams. If you're a Peters fan, you probably love his talent. <laughs> no doubt about it. He has incredible talent. This guy, if he, if he keeps his head on straight, Marcus Peters... Uh, could have a Hall of Fame career if he wanted to. He's just that talented of a guy. He could be an All-Pro just about every year if he wanted to. The reason the Chiefs let him go is he tends to be a distraction. He tends to be a headache. He tends to be kind of a locker room problem. So the Chiefs had just kind of had enough of it. They were pretty much fed up with it. And they decided to let Marcus Peters go. So those of you who, who agree with the Marcus Peters trade, you probably agree that he's a huge headache. Those of you who didn't like it, you're going to miss that talent, and you're not going to be able to replace that talent no matter who you bring in. I don't think you're going to be able to replace his, his talent level, but uh, that doesn't mean the defense can't improve by saying goodbye to Marcus Peters. Now, who did they bring in? Who are the new guys? Started at defensive tackle instead of Benny Logan. You've got Xavier Williams. They signed him to a free agent contract, relatively inexpensive. We'll come back and look at him again in a second. The biggest uh, thing you did on defense was Anthony Hitchens. This is a really good deal right here for the Chiefs. The cap number, $3.6 million. It does jump up next season, but Anthony Hitchens uh, started for the Cowboys, produced very well, very solid numbers. Uh, we'll come back and look at him again in a second. Kendall Fuller, you got this guy, cornerback in a trade with the Washington Redskins for Alex Smith. He's coming in, he's new to the team as well. So you've got new here, new here, new here. Then a guy who didn't start last year, but could possibly start for you this year is Stevie Nelson. Uh, he didn't get a whole lot of playing time last year. He did get some, and you can see his PFF number was very good last year, uh, very, very solid last year. So you're going to see him on the field a lot this year. Those are the, largely the new guys that you're seeing on the team. Now, let's go through. We've got the whole defense up here. Let's go through position by position and see just exactly how you're going to feel about each spot on the defense this year. Now, these 11 guys that I've got up here are not necessarily going to be your 11 starters in the upcoming season. So many things could change this entire board, including but not restricted to injuries, the draft, uh, guys getting demoted, somebody else just really showing up in training camp in the offseason, really uh, stepping up. 
somebody else goes take their spot. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that could change this. This is really just your 11 highest paid players or maybe your best 11 players at the moment based on what we know. But for the Chiefs, this could significantly change during the draft or during a few other things. All right, let's look at the guys. Let's start with the defense, uh, the secondary. Eric Berry. This guy was injured for all but one game last year. He played in the Patriots game. He looked great, as he always does. Then he was on injured list for the rest of the season. Missed the, almost the entire season. He's coming back a cap number of $13 million. If he comes back healthy, even though that's a stout cap number at $13 million, if he comes back healthy, the Eric Berry that we all know and expect and love, Eric Berry is just going to crush it. All right, if he comes back healthy at all, and it may not be at the start of the season, it may be more like the midpoint of the season before he's actually got his football legs back under him. But whenever he gets back to full speed and full health, expect Eric Berry to do what he has always done, and, and that $13 million cap number is very well worth it. On the other side, now, the secondary is right now by far the worst spot on the defense, and this defense was bad last year. I'm not going to put on any pretense that it wasn't. This defense was one of the worst defenses in the NFL last year. They gave up tons of rushing yardage, tons of passing yardage. They just really did not do a good job at almost any point in the season, no, no consistent point in the season, did they do a good job of stopping anything or anybody, even in the playoff game. They got gashed all over for the run game. So that they've got a lot of work to do, but they've already begun that work. So Eric Berry coming back, they're hoping that he comes back to full speed and full help. On the other side, you have Daniel Sorensen. Now, uh, a lot of people are pointing to the fact that Sorensen may not be starting this year. You have Leon McQuay who may be starting. In either case, whether you have Sorensen or McQuay, in either case, you've got your question mark there. It's a huge question mark as to whether or not you actually have anybody who can step up and play this role in safety. Sorensen in 2016 had a rather limited role. He played very well. Last year, they upped his playing time, his start time, and he really struggled. You can see right here, all of these blue numbers, that's the PFF number, Pro Football Focus. You can go on there. What Pro Football Focus does, I'll briefly tell you, they look at what a player does on every single play of every game, and they analyze his technique, and what he was supposed to be doing on that play and how well he did it. So when you see these PFF numbers for these different players in the blue, you're seeing a lot of work done. And Pro Football Focus does a tremendous job. You can go on their website. You can subscribe to them. It, it, the cost is very minimal. They do a tremendous job of analyzing what a guy does on a specific play uh, every single play of every single game of the entire season. So these numbers are not just gifts for it, these are actual fact work. And now the only problem that you're going to have with Pro Football Focus, it's not a problem, it's just a limitation. Pro Football Focus does not analyze whether or not a guy was playing hurt. So if a guy was playing hurt, only 80% of what he could normally do, that has nothing to do with Pro Football's uh, Focus's analysis. All it's showing is that the guy played and, and how well he did or didn't do. It also doesn't show if a guy is playing out of position. So if somebody's good at playing nickel and instead they were asked to play safety all year, Pro Football Focus, their analysis does not include that or cover that, nor should it. Pro Football Focus does a tremendous job of looking at what a guy did on a play and seeing how well he did that. And they put a lot of analysis and a lot of study into that. They do a tremendous job with that. So Pro Football Focus, and that's what all these blue numbers are that you're going to see in the circles. So back to Daniel Sorensen, his Pro Football Focus number last year was 41. Let me say that again, 41. That's a really, really low number. That is a way below average number. This is on a scale going up to about 100. So he played really, really poorly last year. Can he grow into that starting role? I don't know. We've seen Daniel Sorensen for, for a couple of seasons now. I don't know if he can develop into that solid starter that the Chiefs want or not. His cap number is $5.3 million. That's not a horrible cap number. It's also not a great cap number. For $5.3 million, you would hope that Sorensen could at least, at least could step up and play some average football at the safety spot. If you're going to pay him that amount of money, $5.3 million, you would like to see him at least step it up and play average. And he really struggled last year. And, and listen, the PFF numbers, that's not the end-all, be-all. I don't want to be an analytics guy who just does nothing but uh, analyze uh, numbers and crunch numbers. 
Uh, there are other things that, that you have to look at when you're building a football team. Uh, the money and, and whether, or not, whether or not guys playing out of position and the attitude he brings, the leadership he brings. You have to look at all of that. You can't just look at a PFF number, but it's a good indicator of what a guy's been doing. And Sam Sorensen struggled last year. No matter which way you slice it, he really struggled with all of his additional duties and his additional playing time. So whether you see Sorensen here or whether you see Leon McQuay here, there's a very good question mark right here. What are the Chiefs going to be able to do here at safety? We'll come back to that a little bit later and when we talk about the draft. Kendall Fuller, these are the cornerbacks right here. Kendall Fuller, this is one of the best values on the entire defense. Brought over from the Redskins, he played two seasons for them. He still has two seasons left on his rookie deal. He is making $648,000. His PFF score last year was a 90. He had a tremendous season, there's no doubt about it. The only question for Kendall Fuller is, can he do that in a starting role consistently? Last year, he only started about four games for the Redskins. He played in more games than that, but he only started four games. Can he step up? And that's the question. Can he step up and do that consistently, game in and game out? I don't know that you're necessarily going to see a 90 next year from Kendall Fuller, but if he at least scores in the 80s, you have a tremendous value, a tremendous bargain, and a tremendous deal made by Brett Veach, the general manager. So that's what they're hoping for, and they've got every reason to hope for that. What he has shown on the field, especially last year, has been tremendous. So we're going to see if he can keep that up from a starting role all next season, and he's only getting paid $648,000, the same thing next year as well. So you feel like you've got that cornerback spot taken care of. You probably don't feel like you have to worry about that too much, but you still want to know, can he do that during the next offseason? Now, moving over here, you got another question mark with Steven Nelson. And listen, Steven Nelson may not be the guy who starts here. Uh, Keith Reeser could also start here. But Steven Nelson's making a little bit more money, $2.1 million. He had a PFF last year of 77. But again, it was very limited playing time for Steven Nelson. He did not start all the games last year. He didn't get a ton of playing time necessarily compared to the starters. So he's got a cap number of $2.1 million, and his PFF was 77. On paper, it kind of looks promising, but really this is a big question mark. Really, this is, this, whether it's Nelson or Reeser, this is something that you're really going to worry about. Do we have this taken care of? And by far, the secondary is the weakest part of the Chiefs' defense, even with Fuller, even with Barry. Neither one of these are guaranteed to come and play strong this year. You've got strong hopes in Fuller. You like what you saw from him last year with Washington. You really think you've got that spot taken care of. You have to feel great about it, but that's not a guarantee. Eric Berry, you know what he can bring every time he steps on the field, but you have to ask yourself, is he going to come back full speed? Is he going to come back healthy? Is he going to be the Eric Berry that we knew before? So you like both of these guys. You feel good about both of them. If you're Brett Beach, you have to. He even said the other day he felt good about Steven Nelson and, and Keith Reeser. But really, these two spots here, whether it's Sorensen or McQuay, Nelson or Reeser, you've got big question marks here, and you've got to be worried about these two spots. You're not going to come out and say that if you're uh, Brett Beach. You're not going to come out and tell Chiefs fans that you're worried about these spots, but you have to be. You have to be concerned about these two spots on defense right here. And really, for Chiefs fans, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Let's look at the linebackers. This is the whole linebacking core right here. There has been talk, because the Chiefs struggled so much with the running game last year, there has been talk from fans and media about the Chiefs switching from a four-linebacker set to a three-linebacker set, off the three-man defensive front into a four-man defensive front. I haven't heard anything about that from Andy Reid or Brett Beach. Don't have any clue what their plans are, but the Chiefs have played with four linebackers as their base set for years and years now. So we have no word that that's going to change. Also, these seven players that you see right here on the front seven, these are their best seven players in the front seven. So I don't know that you're going to see that change next year. We'll keep it like it is for now. If we find out different, we'll redo re re this. So right now we've got four linebackers playing. Justin Houston, you know what he's going to bring. He always brings it. 88 PFF score last year, and he earned every one of those. He plays tremendous every single season. He has a massive cap number, $20.6 million. This is not a number 
where you're getting a great value. It's just where you are paying a very, very good player, a great player. Justin Houston gets to the quarterback consistently. He really gets a pass rush on Justin Houston. Not a great value, but a great player. If you're Andy Reid and you're looking at him, you're thankful to have him because he's just a tremendous player. He gets so much pressure off the edge that teams have to do a lot to counter with that and adds flexibility to your defense. So Justin Houston, that spot is completely locked up. You don't have to worry about that at all. He's an 88, making $20.6 million. You move to the inside. Here's Anthony Hitchens. Hitchens signed from the Cowboys through free agency. He was an 81 last year. And that was a solid 81. He got tons of playing time. This is not a spot that you're going to have to worry about, I don't think, for the upcoming next few seasons. They gave him, I think it was a four-year deal. That cap number, $3.6 million, is a great cap number for the upcoming season, so the value is really good. It goes up a lot next year, but for this upcoming season, it's only $3.6 million. So you have to feel like you've got that inside linebacker spot taken care of, not just for this season, but also for the next three or four seasons. You've really got to feel like you have locked that spot up. And what they tried to do, the Chiefs, during this offseason, they tried to do a couple of things. They tried to get younger and cheaper on defense, and they did that. By and large, the new guys that you see, Fuller, Hitchens, Williams, are all younger and cheaper than the guys that the Chiefs let go, with still maintaining the hope that these three guys that they brought in can be better than the guys they let go. So the Chiefs have no reason to think that they've gotten any worse on defense, except in the secondary, where they let go of Marcus Peters, an extremely talented guy. But when you look at the rest of this, and, and the hope of Fuller, there's still the hope that Fuller can step up and do what Peters did without all the distractions. But when you look at what the Chiefs did here, they got younger and cheaper on defense through Fuller, Hitchens, and Williams. Now, with Hitchens, you totally feel like that inside linebacker spot is locked up for the next four seasons. Don't know if Hitchens is going to be an all-pro. Don't think I necessarily expect that. But for the money, you're just expecting him to step up and be a solid starter. Perhaps over the next four seasons, he can make one or two Pro Bowls if he continues to improve. He seems to be on an upswing as far as his playing ability goes, his performance goes. So you've got to feel like with Anthony Hitchens, you've really locked up that spot. Reggie Ragland. Um, the value here is very good. How good is Ragland going to be? Nobody really seems to know. But he had a PFF last year of 79, so he played well, and his value is just south of a million dollars. He's only making $981,000 next season. So he's a great value, and really you've got to feel good about all four of these linebackers across the board for the most part. Ragland played well last year, PFF was good, his performance was there, and he's only making just a little less than a million dollars. So you've got to feel really good about Ragland there as well. D Ford. Now, D. Ford played in six games last year. He did not have a great PFF, um, but listen, in six games, that's really not a good way to, to measure him. With D. Ford here, and we had some, some uh, a little bit of confusion on the last time I discussed D. Ford. I'm going to clear that up because that was my fault. D. Ford is making $8.7 million this upcoming season. He was injured for 10 games last year. You don't know what you're getting out of D. Ford. The last time D. Ford was on the field, and looked great was in 2016. He had, I believe it was, I want to say it was 10 sacks. Nine of those were in six games, however. In six games, he had nine of those sacks. So he can get to the quarterback. You know the ability is there for D. Ford. Coming off an injury, though, how, how strong will he be? The hope is for D. Ford is that coming into a contract season next year, he's not signed to a contract after this season. You hope coming into contract year that he's really going to play well for you and he's not going to make you not regret having to pay him $8.7 million because in six games last year, even though he was still in his rookie deal, he was not showing any kind of ability to be worth $8.7 million. But I think if he can come back healthy, and he's not healthy yet, which may be the reason the Chiefs still have him, the Chiefs gave him his fifth year option, and that's what that is, $8.7 million. The Chiefs gave him his fifth-year option last offseason, not this offseason. Had they waited to give it to him this offseason, they might not have given it to him, having missed all of 10 games last year. D. Ford probably would not be on the Chiefs right now, making $8.7 million cap hit, 
had they waited until this offseason to give him that fifth year option. But last year, John Dorsey, the general manager at the time, decided to go ahead and give it to him, and it seemed like a no-brainer. He was coming off of 10 sacks in season number three, heading into season number four. It seemed like an easy decision to just go ahead and pick up that fifth-year option. When they picked up that fifth-year option, there was an injury guarantee with it. That is, by the date, I think it was March the 1st or March the 14th, I forget which, if, if March 1st, March 14th rolled around of this year, and he was injured or unable to pass his physical, then that $8.7 million option was guaranteed for him. Uh, had he been able to take that physical and be healthy for that physical, the Chiefs might have let him go instead of paying him the $8.7 million. So with D Ford, you know the ability is there, you know the motivation is there since it's in a contract year. You don't know how healthy he's going to be. So that's a question mark. You hope that he lives up to the $8.7 million that you're paying him, that you saw the flashes of brilliance from him in season number three. That's what you're hoping to get out of D. Ford this year. We'll find that out. But in, in any case, if he produces at all, if he's healthy and he produces at all and he's just an average starter, you got to feel really good about all four of these linebackers right here, from Houston to Hitchens to Ragland to Ford. You've got to feel good about what you're going to get out of these guys from a value standpoint. Now, let's move down and look at the defensive line. Chris Jones is probably your best value on the entire defense. Not on the team. You've got a great one on the other side of the ball as well. But Chris Jones here just really exploded last year. 88 PFF, tons of playing time, really produced at a high level. He looks like the kind of guy who could become an all-pro guy who could become a regular pro bowler. He looks like he's got that much talent, that much performance level, and that much heart is what he looks like. So at $1.7 million, that's all you're paying him next season. If he even performs anywhere in the 80s, you're still getting a great value. If he performs at that 88 to 90 level for PFF score, you have one of the all-time best values in the NFL going. So Chris Jones, Really a stellar, really a stellar player. Got to be excited about him stepping up there on the defensive line. You move to Xavier Williams. Xavier Williams is 27 years old. He scored an 81 last year. He did not get a ton of playing time, though. Did not get a ton of playing time. And even though he's big, he's going to be able to stuff, stuff the defense, even though you're expecting that. He did not get a ton of playing time. You don't really know what you're getting out of Xavier Williams. You think you've got a big guy who can help stuff the run, which really hurt Kansas City last year. That's what you think you've got. I think that's what you've got, but you don't know for sure because he just didn't play a lot last year. Just didn't get a whole lot of playing time. But when he stepped in the field, he looked good. He looked solid. At $2 million, you're not risking anything from a financial standpoint. Now, you may be worried about production, but you're not worried about value because at $2 million, it really is costing you nothing to find out if Xavier Williams can play, and they think he can, and I tend to agree with that. So I think you feel pretty good about Xavier Williams. You feel great about Chris Jones. And then you come to Alan Bailey. Alan Bailey produces a lot of mixed feelings. This is a workmanlike guy. This is a guy who produces. You can see the PFF score, 72. It's not bad. It's just average. When you go over and look at the statistics, they're average. They're decent. The problem with Alan Bailey is he's making $8 million. When you're making $8 million, you would like to see him playing better than that. Even though if you took away the number and you just looked at him as a football player, he's a good football player. He produces. He shows up. He works. He works hard. And he scores a 72 on the PFF. His statistics are there. His production is there. So if you weren't looking at the finances, you would feel okay about Alan Bailey too, and you would feel okay about this entire front three right here. But... When you're looking at that $8.0 million, it's just shy of $8 million next season. It's a pretty stout cap number for somebody who's right there at the bottom end of the average scoring range. And for, for the Chiefs, for Allen Bailey, what they're hoping for is to get him to push that up just a little bit, produce just a little bit more, a little bit better. You basically know what you're getting out of Allen Bailey. I don't think he has a huge ceiling. I don't think you're going to see a lot of explosion out of him, but you would like to see that come up some. You'd like to be able to see him produce a little bit more during this next season and do a little bit better than that to try to justify the $8.0 million that you're giving to him there. But even so, 
you have to feel decent about this front three. You love Chris Jones. You have hope for Xavier Williams. And Alan Bailey, you know, is at least going to work and bring in a solid performance. You hope he can increase that a little bit. The linebackers, you've got to feel great about all across the board with assuming that the D four comes back in healthy. You've got other guys you can bring in on rotation, but these are the top guys that they're looking at right now, the most talented guys. They've got a couple of rookies. Every team does. They've got a couple of guys who were rookies last year, second round picks and such as that who are playing, they're hoping that they really get a big boost of performance out of them, but you don't know that. So, again, not knowing what we're getting out of those young guys who are there on the depth bench, and that's Andy Reid's problem to figure that out. You feel pretty good about this front seven. It's cheaper, it's younger. I think this defense is going to do better. It couldn't do a whole lot worse than it did last year, so I'm not saying a whole lot there. You're not going to see this defense jump up into the top ten of the NFL next year. Even if, even if Eric Berry comes back at full strength, even if Kendall Fuller continues to play close to that, even if Bailey steps up and plays at that 75 range, even if D. Ford comes back healthy and produces, you're not going to see this Chiefs defense jump up all the way to the top 10 in the NFL. It's just not going to happen. They haven't upgraded that much. But I think it is reasonable to expect that this Chiefs defense could conceivably if you get some of these injured players back up to healthy, if the rest of the guys, the young guys, perform like you, you hope they can, you think that this defense can improve and at least start to push up towards maybe middle of the pack in the NFL this next season. Let's talk about the draft for just a second, and then we're going to close out. All the defensive, all the, all the draft guys that you're reading after are saying two things. If, if the Chiefs are going to draft defensively, and I'm not touching the offensive side of the ball at all, the Chiefs could draft on offense as well, but I'm not covering that in this video. If the Chiefs do draft defensively, everyone is saying that they're going to go secondary and defensive line. Everyone is saying that they're going to go try to fix something here in the secondary, because this is by far the weakest part of your defense, probably the weakest part of your team, is a secondary with Nelson and Reeser and McQuay and Sorensen. You got a lot of question marks. You don't know what you're getting. You have no guarantees. And I think you have a lot of real concerns right there in the secondary. So it wouldn't surprise me at all with one of those second and third round picks for them to at least draft one guy out of the secondary, probably at cornerback, I would, I would assume. Depends on what's there. It also would not be surprising and listen, any team can do this, but the Chiefs are in a good position to do it. And Brett Veach acknowledged this during the draft, uh, during the, the talk the other day that he gave the interview. If there's a guy there late in the first round that they really, really like, you wouldn't be surprised to see the Chiefs package up some of those second and third round picks to move up into the first round to get somebody. And if the talent's there, you'd have to really admire their, their ability to go for it. But... I don't know that you're going to see that. It's just something that's on the table that they could do. If they keep those second and third round picks, I feel really strongly that they're going to at least use one of them on the secondary to bring in some competition. Second round picks in the NFL are usually not ready to start the next season. A lot of them do due to injury or due to the team just being weak at a certain position. A lot of second round picks do start in the NFL. But they're usually just not ready. They're not that seasoned. They don't have that maturity yet. They don't have the talent to overcome that lack of experience yet. But it happens all the time. Every year, there are a few guys in the second round who not only start, but they blossom. And they really bloom that first year. On average, though, if you're drafted in the second round, you're hoping to get a guy who can start in a season or two. But the Chiefs have needs that are so bad here in the secondary that if there's a guy there early in the second round, uh, in the mid-second round area, who, who they think is good at cornerback or safety, either spot, it wouldn't surprise me at all for them to just really draft that, and maybe even two picks, but I think at least you're going to see one in the second, third round come out of the, the secondary. A lot of folks, a lot of the draft experts, and I'm not a draft expert at all, so I'm not naming names here, a lot of the draft experts are saying that they may go defensive line just to add depth. And I wouldn't be surprised at all at that in the third round if you've got a guy 
So he ended second round too, but especially in the third round if you didn't see a guy drafted on the defensive line. Now, one more thing to watch out for, and we're done. Not this offseason, but the next offseason, 2019, looking ahead. It's very possible, and I'm not predicting the future here. I'm just trying to tell you what Brett Veach is looking at as he looks ahead. It's very possible that Justin Houston may not be on the team any longer because of his cap number, because of the dead cap space that it would eat up to let him go. Justin Houston may not be here for the 2019 season. Alan Bailey, same thing. Because the cap number is so high, the dead cap space to let him go is so small, he may not be here for the 2019 season either. On the other side, D. Ford, the same thing. We already talked about it. He's on his fifth-year option. D. Ford, probably not going to be here during the, the offseason. So here's three guys. Alan Bailey is not necessarily a great pass rusher. Ford and Houston are your main pass rushers with a little bit from Bailey. But that's three guys who play on the edges who are probably either possibly or probably going to be gone next offseason. So it also wouldn't surprise me if the Chiefs went defense if they picked up an edge rusher of some sort. Because, number one, that's always a valued asset in the NFL. You can always use a guy who can get after the quarterback. But number two, these guys could be gone. Houston could be gone. Bailey could be gone. D. Ford could certainly be gone next offseason. Not guaranteeing any of that. Don't know what the Chiefs have in, have in store for that, but those three guys could be gone. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Chiefs didn't use a second or third rounder on a guy who can really come off the edge and get some pressure on the quarterback. A lot of those guys tend to go up in the first round, so you may not see anybody, but if there's somebody dropping for whatever reason, and it just depends on who's there available at that spot because you just don't have any idea who can be available at those second and third round spots. If they've got a guy who fits as an edge rusher, better than fits in the secondary or fits as defensive line depth. Don't be surprised if the Chiefs do that either. They're not going to go inside linebacker. I would really be surprised if they go safety in those spots. But look for cornerback, look for edge rusher, look maybe for just some solid defensive line depth in the draft upcoming. All right, long video. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for spending the time with us. We'll do this again after the draft. We'll come back and look at the defense and see what the Chiefs did to maybe modify some of this. Thank you so much. Have a great night. We'll see you next time on Sports and Money. I'm Ben Parker. Thank you very much. Bye.